The New Statesman. Hi, I'm Anoush. I'm Freddie. And on today's New Statesman podcast, we discuss the tributes to the Queen. And you ask us, how does the death of the Queen affect political scrutiny? So, Freddie, you were watching some of the tributes in Parliament over Friday. Tell me a bit about what the mood was like in the House of Commons and what kind of speeches stood out to you. Yeah, so it was a very sombre mood. I remember in the press gallery, we had to wait outside while they did the minute silence. And then as we walked in, there was a sea of black below us because obviously everyone was in wearing black with black ties. So that was quite noticeable. That was quite shocking. And then we had the first speech from Liz Truss, the Prime Minister, which was quite short to the point... I don't think her oratory has massively improved within the two days since her first speech as Prime Minister. Keir Starmer's speech, however, was I thought was quite compelling and well-written. You also heard from Boris Johnson, Theresa May. There was also a brilliant speech from Harriet Harman speaking about the different gender roles when the Queen mm. ascended to the throne, which I thought was very noticeable and actually spoke to some of the similar themes that Andrew spoke about in his piece for us this week. The mood was very much trying to remember amusing, lively anecdotes of the Queen, because obviously many parliamentarians have met the Queen over their careers. OK, and did any of the speeches stand out to you or any of the anecdotes that you heard? Harman's anecdote was quite nice. It was when she was removed from her office at the time. I can't remember which one it was. And the Queen sent her a personal note to uh, invite her to come to the palace and to see her. So I thought that was nice. There was many of those acknowledgements of the Queen's personal touch and a willingness to reach out to people perhaps when they've just fallen from the stage. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? It tells you quite a lot about her character. And then I quite liked Theresa May's story about dropping the cheese on the floor when she'd (laughs) gone to a picnic at Balmoral. And I think the story was that she quickly picked it up and put it back on the picnic table and turned around and saw that the Queen had been watching her the entire time and just gave a knowing smile. (laughs) And actually that reminded, do you remember when Theresa May (laughs) caused this minor row when she said that she just scrapes the mould off jam and carries off eating? carries on eating it. I don't remember remember that, but there definitely should have been a row about it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So really, we know that Theresa May must have an excellent immune system (laughs) the way that she treats her food. No, it was a really, yeah, it's been a really strange time in the past few days, obviously, because politics, as usual, has Mm. been suspended. But nevertheless, a proclamation for the new king is, in a way, a political event. And actually, there have been some protesters who have shouted out objections. A man shouted who elected him when the proclamation was read out in Oxford. Mm. And then in in Edinburgh, there was a little bit of booing and there have been arrests and that's been quite controversial, hasn't it? Yeah, quite. we shouldn't overstate the dissent. I don't think there was widespread booing in Edinburgh, but it was certainly there. But you're right, the monarch is our head of state. They are part of parliament. Parliament's three parts. It's the Lords, the Commons, it's also the monarch. They have to approve our laws before they come into effect. So yeah, that is a political position. Obviously, I think we can speak about the practicalities of the monarch and that they sit above day-to-day politics, but within our constitutional system, they're certainly the keystone there. So I think questions about how we do order ourselves in this society and the political systems we choose are very much open. And I do think the arrests are particularly worrying because it's moments like these, it's the crises, it's the wars, it's the successions when freedom of speech is most important and it's most often comes under threat because you know it's, it's, it's when the mobbish sentimentality comes to the fore and people aren't as tolerant of other people's views so that's when you need to be on your guard the most yeah and actually this is you know it's interesting because these are two different events aren't they the funeral for a much loved sort of head of state and woman and mother and yeah. person which everyone can relate to and the proclamation for a new king which is it's different they're two different ceremonial things happening at the same time and actually I think on accession day the flags that were at half mast should have been at full mast because it was supposed to be a celebration of the right. new monarch which is quite interesting I was speaking to a friend of mine who's a priest and he was saying that there was a bit of worry that the public might be a bit confused by seeing yeah. flags at full mast for example so that shows that there's two different events going on basically across the country and it's not that sort of any people objecting have been dis- respectful to the memory of the Queen, it's more their objection to the... Yeah, but even if they are, that should be also fine. I think the reason, the Edinburgh arrest was very interesting. I think one woman was holding a sign saying abolish the monarchy and apparently, according to reports, the crime that she broke was a breach of the peace. (laughs) <laughs> which right. almost has that medieval <laughs> ring to it yeah. which fits the uh, fits what happened so yeah I mean, people should be able to 
say what they want at any point. And you were at Buckingham Palace, weren't you, on Friday afternoon? Yeah, so I was at the, you know, I went to the tributes in Parliament, then I wandered up through St. James's Park to the Palace as people were gathering. The foreign news stations were there every 20 metres or so down the mile. We had the tents ready for the television stations. And I wouldn't say there was an atmosphere of sadness or upset, I think. Many of the voices were foreign. It felt very much like a global spectacle. Of course, most people, that would have been because many people were tourists, most other people would have been working. And I think that's why one reason you've seen so many more people going today than on Friday. But yeah, I think that there was an anticipation for the new. There was an acceptance of what happened. I think lots of people felt grateful to be part of history. There was much excitement when the king walked in front of the crowds and spoke to people. There was also a sense of ordinary. That's Even these events can't escape that. People talking about their breakfast or reminiscing or you know, trying to push past to not to miss the event. So yeah, the, these events I always feel as if they should be special, but there's also the sense that it's just another day. Yeah, that's what was lovely in your piece that you wrote about it, which I think all our listeners should go and read. It was more of a sort of sketch of the occasion, mm. wasn't it? And I think you really brought out that sort of low-key, day-to-day Britishness that there is even when momentous events happen like this. Yeah. yeah. And we were going to talk a little bit about the Queen's relationship with Scotland, because that is where her coffin has been mm. being driven through. And of course, she died at Balmoral, which was we hear her favourite place and we will be talking to Chris Deere in our Scotland editor about that on a future episode but sadly he's unwell so he wasn't able to speak to us today Hi, it's Anoush here This is just a reminder that as a podcast listener you have the option of subscribing to the New Statesman with a very special offer You can subscribe for just a pound a week That's 12 weeks for £12 If you go to newstatesman.com forward slash podcast offer We'll be right back From the New Statesman comes a new podcast, Audio Long Reads. The best of our reported features and essays, read aloud. Featuring writing from our authors, including Ian McEwan on wrestling with Orwell's Inside the Whale. Might we reasonably assume that there is no longer an inside to the whale? That the creature lies stranded on the beach, as whales sometimes are? That the guts and blubber and ribcage are on display? A Year Inside GB News with Stuart McGurk. At first, the problems weren't ideological, but practical, technical, and quite, well, obvious. And Maria Wilczek on Belarusian football fans who took on Alexander Lukashenko. After the August 2020 protests, hundreds of ultras were roughed up and held in custody. One was later found dead in suspicious circumstances. Ease into the weekend with our audio long reads, published every Saturday morning. Just search audio long reads from the New Statesman wherever you get your podcasts. And now it's time for a section we like to call You Ask Us. So we've got a question from Nick today. Thanks for writing in. He says, without wanting to seem glib or diminish the death of the Queen in and of itself, can you discuss how the sad passing will affect the Truss Premiership, especially given the importance of momentum in the first 100 days? Mm. This is a really good question because actually one of the stories over the weekend was how little parliamentary time there is for scrutiny of bills and introduction of new bills, actually, which are often what characterise a new Mm. premiership because we'll have conference recess in the next couple of weeks, really. And there are ongoing talks, aren't there, about trying to reduce the conference recess time so that there's more time for MPs in Parliament. Yeah, we've already had the Lib Dems cancel their conference, which was due this weekend because of the funeral. And then, yeah, Parliament was only about to sit for three weeks or so. And it was a massive three weeks for government because they had to try and pass legislation for the cost of living crisis. The impact of the Queen's death was very evident, even from the moment that it was announced. I was in the the Commons when Keir Starmer was handed the note saying that the Queen was ill, that that statement that we heard from Buckingham Palace. And you just felt the, the benches empty one by one and the sense of gravitas quickly moved away from this exceptionally important bill 
towards this exceptionally important constitutional event. So the impact was very stark. The level of scrutiny on the energy price guarantee, which the government said would mean energy prices would be frozen at around £2,500 for the typical household for two years. And the government did not provide costings for this, which was shocking. Because given the size of this, we don't have the costings, so we don't exactly know how much it's going to cost. But it looks like it's going to be north of uh, £100 billion, which is much more than the furlough scheme, for instance. And in addition to that, the government has said they're going to fund it through debt. Mm. Bearing in mind, our debt's already exceptionally high. I think it's around £2.5 trillion. The cost of borrowing is also going up because we've got interest rates rising. So there's lots to to break through here and to talk about and to scrutinise. And of course, we aren't having that. The announcement came as soon as we had the announcement about the Queen's death so it's been overshadowed and i don't know how that's going to impact the scrutiny or the passage of the bill we were supposed to have the costings for the bill come at a fiscal event later this month it's not yet clear when that's going to happen and is that to liz truss's advantage here because it gives her a little bit more time to work that Mm. out what she's going to say in that mini budget or whatever's coming down the line or is it that you really need to define yourself in those first few days I think that an announcement like the one that she made about this big energy bill bailout would have probably given her a bounce as significant as Rishi Sunak's bounce after he announced the furlough scheme. Obviously, we're we're talking about the ins and outs of the political kind of (laughs) benefits of this, but it is important, isn't it? It will be something Mm. that her her advisors will, if not explicitly, but definitely implicitly, be thinking about in these few days. Oh, completely. It was the main job for Liz Truss when she came into government to address this. We're going to have the price increase from October, so she had to do it very quickly. And I think it's really interesting because, on the one hand, as you said, this uh, package would hopefully benefit her and help her in the in the polls but then we've also got this huge constitutional week where for instance she's going to be going around the country attending the ceremonies of the proclamations for the king i think that also is going to lend a, a little bit of gravitas to her role it puts her right at the the front of this event and i think that, that, that potentially benefit her but it does take away from her being able to define her prior priorities yeah. as prime minister outside mm. of this emergency help because as we know and we've spoken about on this podcast previously The announcement for price fixing runs completely counter to her entire political philosophy, which is for a less interfering and much smaller state deregulation. So we know that this is totally against her political instincts. So there were other things that she wanted to introduce that she was campaigning on Mm. during her leadership campaign that she would have wanted to try and sort of make headway with in the first 100 days of her premiership. And I've actually been speaking to a civil servant who she'd been drafted onto one of the priority areas for Liz Truss's premiership beyond cost of living. I won't Mm. say what it is in case it identifies my source, but she was quite worried actually about how little time there would be to even introduce the legis- legislation at all. So it does take away from your ability to to set out your stall for what kind of prime minister you really are and what your priorities are. Um, yeah, completely. And though I would say that that wasn't clear in her speech, her speech as prime minister, which was cliche ridden and didn't yes. set out a clear list of priorities. So she did have the opportunity before this crisis, and I don't think she did a cracking job of doing that. It, that not to say that the policies wouldn't come in themselves, yeah, but just yeah. on the marketing of it, I no, don't think yeah. it was particularly clear. And then I think the other thing worth speaking about is Labour here, because you've got to remember that they were the first ones to introduce or propose the policy of a price cap, only for six months though. And now the Conservatives have come out and blown them out the water, part, partly by saying it's going to be two years. So that's, again, an instance like with like the windfall tax uh, earlier this year where Labour have put forward a policy only for the Conservatives to cannibalise it later on. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you do get that sort of, maybe that short term ability to be smug on a new on a media round and say they stole our policy yeah. but actually that's not what voters remember about policies no. is it that it was a lib dem policy to keep taking more and more people out of the personal tax well to move the personal tax allowance higher and yeah. higher at the threshold but now the conservatives boast about that policy as if it was entirely their own and people don't remember necessarily that it was a, an idea concocted by Nick Clegg when yeah. he was he was Lib Dem leader. And you have so many other examples of that. And the energy cap in itself, mm. that was Ed Miliband's idea, mm. but of course taken by Theresa May. I don't know whether or not the legacy of that policy <laughs> that is in doubt, but still it's not. It's a bit like when a government U-turns 
do you remember that they U-turned or do you just remember yeah. the policy that they U-turned to if you're not a nerd like us and you're just <laughs> yeah, kind no, of precisely. normally I'm engaged not, in politics? <laughs> I've never met these people. Uh, <laughs> and Labour, I think, were conscious of this. They knew that they had to do lots of media, lots of speeches about their policy before Liz Truss got into power mm. or her or Rishi Sunak because they thought it was there was a big chance of them taking the idea. So they were they did try and make headway with it, which was certainly wise because now we've seen that come that's seen that bear out. Yeah. You've been listening to the New Statesman podcast with me, Anoush Shekelian, and my colleague, Freddie Haywood. We're produced by Adrian Bradley, and our music is Devil with the Devil, licensed under Creative Commons. Thanks so much for listening, and don't forget to leave us a nice review and subscribe.